Meryl, our, our, our anointed teacher, <laughs> our equipper, our Tuesday equipper. Yeah, come in, sir. Come in, sir. Morning, and, uh, all. Morning, all. Morning. To have you all. with us. Okay. It's been a little bit of a disruptive morning. So, um, Father, I just want to really play, play the blood of Jesus around every one of us here. And... Uh, we just come against anything, anything that the enemy is throwing up against us at this moment that's trying to rob, kill, and destroy. Father, surround us with your warrior angels and your ministry angels and everyone here on this platform, Lord. Just protect them and bless them in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you glory. Give you glory. Give you glory. Hi, guys. Uh, hope you're all good. As I said, it's been a very hectic morning for me uh, this morning, uh, but we're all good. We're all good. The Father is good. Um, today's session, I just want to ask a question. You've all got your notepads. What do you think is the most important tool that we have in our toolbox? So just write on your piece of paper, what do you think is the most important tool? So it's just something to think about. And, you know, in this series, I was thinking about the series that I'm doing and where I'm going. And it's quite interesting that as I prepare, the Holy Spirit always takes me on another little journey. I think I'm going to do this and then I'm doing that. So it's quite exciting for me because I never know what really I'm going to be doing next week. <laughs> um, when I uh, look at this session, if you could grasp this session, you can go make disciples because this is what the big commission is about. As we go, make disciples. This presentation this is what I'm going to share on today. If you grasp that, you are there. If, the, if in anything you grasp, you grasp this, you can do this. So I'm going to share my screen right now, and I'm going to share that one there, and up it comes, and start from the current slide. Okay, or can we all see that? Is that okay, Marks? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay, right. I'm just trying to move this thing out the way. Yeah, right. Right. So, our toolbox. So, the question is what I was asking. Our first tool is drum roll, please. Mm -hmm. Yourself. <laughs> it's all about ourselves being the tool through which God can work and we have to listen we need to understand as people reveal and if you can learn to listen and listen correctly you've actually then become a, a, a channel for the Holy Spirit to work. It's all about ourselves. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is somebody who represents. And Angela was praying that, and I love what she said, that as the Father loved Jesus, May that still be seen in us, that same love, because that's what we are. We are his physical presence here, carrying the Holy Spirit. So when the world sees us, when people see us, 
they see Jesus. That's what they got to see. Um, I know that uh, it's been said somewhere, I can't remember who quoted it, but the first gospel that people see is us. And therefore, we are ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, which he is. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So this is our role that we are trying to fulfill to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. So our role goes on a little bit. Our role is being a connection between God and the person seeking help. And I'll share my little story that I've written in my book, A Road to Freedom, but I'll do the PowerPoint that I've cre able to create. So we have a power station. The power station is where the power is generated. Then you've got all these transmission lines and they bring the power to the light. And the way I've always described it is when I'm working with people, I say, you see that light in the ceiling? That's the miracle that is necessary in your life. What is important is the power which is generated, which is God. And it goes down a line. And it's your decision, the switch, to switch that to allow that power. All I am is the wire between the power station and you. And I'm nothing more but a transmission line. And when you look at it in a room, you don't even see the wires. And we, as we are helping people, need to be always aware that we can be replaced by the Father at any time for any person. We are not the issue the father and the person. And we're just holding hands across this space. That's our role. Being a connection between God and the person seeking help. And the key here is listening. We've got to listen. So you've got a guy talking. You've got to listen with both ears to the Holy Spirit and to the guy at the same time. I'm always asking a certain question. My question is, what does this person need? I can think of what I could give him, but what does he actually need? And that's why we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be listening. And whenever I'm working, I'm always saying, what does this person need? I can think I can do this, do this, do this. But what does this person need? And sometimes it is just listening, not even saying anything. So I always hold this question. What does this person need? Our aim uh, this is annoying me a little bit this morning. Oops, I'll try and get rid of it. Um is to create a growth promoting climate in which individuals can move forward and become capable of being their true self. Or in our language, to be the person God created them to be. And there are a couple of things that we need to uh, bear in mind to try and achieve this. It is achieved through us having what we call congruence. It's just being genuine, being real. Let us stop pretending we're something we are not. We're just ordinary human beings with our own failings. And if we can be real, then people start identifying with us. 
if we are struggling in some way, obviously we were not talking about a whole lot of self-disclosure of your, your deep problems. But if we are struggling in some way, like I came on today and I said, hey, listen, I've been having quite a hectic morning. It's been genuine. It's been real. I'm not coming in and say, hey, Lord, praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Yes, he is. But I'm also being real where, where I'm at at the moment. And congruence is a very, very important aspect because they will pick up when we fake in it. You will not pull it, the wool across their eyes. People will see when we are faking it. So let's be real as we can. We need to be accepting and caring, and it's called unconditional positive regard or non judgmental. We always got to be accepting and caring where people are at. And we need to create empathetic understanding. Now, there are a number of words here. There's three words that we're going to quickly look at. It's not in the notes. But we can often have sympathy. I can sympathize. Oh, that's so terrible because I start uh, understanding that pain in some way. We can also have identification. So um, just let's use a current issue, Black Lives Matter. If you were a person of color and somebody was talking to you about how they've been discriminated at work, you would be able to identify. But what we need is empathetic understanding. That is getting inside their shoes, experiencing where the shoe pinches or where the shoe hurts, but still being able to be outside of the situation to be able to give a stability to their struggle and obviously a connection to the Holy Spirit. So empathy is, is a very, very important thing that we must have, but we mustn't get sucked into the story because then we are just going to be tumbling in the same uh, emotional distress as where they are, as we can do with sympathy, as we can do with identification. So we need to create this empathetic, yep, that is very difficult. And one of the things that I'm going to encourage you never to say, oh, I understand. We don't understand. We never really understand what another person's pain is like because we are so uniquely different. We can have similar experiences, but we can't really understand. And this... Uh, three things is from Dr. Carl Rogers in 1957. Our attitude, we got to be like Jesus. Just look through the scriptures, the gospels, and just see how Jesus handled various situations. We got to show his love, his incredible unending love. We got to extend his grace. Unmerited favor. We cannot grab grace. Grace is given. He has forgiven us. We can only receive it. We can't grab it. Because he understands our weaknesses. We got to extend that in the same way. Remember, we are Christ's ambassadors. And we need to have passion and compassion. You see, when you have passion, it doesn't matter what the situation looks like. You will go for it. Uh, when people have got passion, they don't look at the odds that are stacked against them. They just go for it. 
And if we think of, and I'm going to use some of my heroes of the faith, um, we look at Sister Teresa, the work she did. There was a passion there. And she had the compassion. If we look at Jackie Pullinger and the work she did in Hong Kong and is doing, there's a passion and a compassion. And we need to have that passion and compassion, but you can't self-create this. It comes from God. We got to be humble and teachable. None of us know it all. 1 Corinthians 13 at the end says, we see through a mirror darkly, we only know in part. Everyone here at, on planet Earth has got a different perspective of this aspect of living in this world. Everybody is different. It's only our Father in heaven who's omniscient and omnipresent that knows everything. So we always got to be humble and teachable and learning. I'm learning all the time. And Jesus said this. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now that word yoke in the Greek is a balance beam. It's not an ox yoke. Just before that in the scripture, the yoke that he was talking about was like an ox yoke. But this yoke is the balance beam, the balance in life. Take my balance upon you and learn from me. Now, this is where the words that I wanted us to be. For I am gentle and humble in heart. This is our Lord Jesus Christ. He is gentle and humble. And when we work with people, we need to be gentle and humble. And then we find rest for our souls. And Jesus also said, we judge according to the flesh, flesh, but I judge no one. And this was before Jesus has even gone to the cross. And I'm not going to go into the context of that. But why he wasn't judging? Because he knew people were incapable because of the brokenness of this world to do it any differently. So he didn't have an expectation of people to perform in a specific way. And we need to keep that same attitude as we're working with people. People are broken. They come out of brokenness. They struggle in many, many ways. And we cannot have this expectation of them to perform in a specific way because of their brokenness. Yes, we have the scriptures of how we should be living. But to live like that when we come out of brokenness is impossible. And we mustn't judge people just because they cannot perform in a way that the scripture tells us how we should be. We need to always be open-minded when we're working with people. Remember, we don't know this story. Be curious. How did they experience that event? Sorry, I just clicked on there. I was trying to move something. How did they experience the events? We mustn't judge what we do not fully understand. We are not the expert of our life. And lastly, don't try to fix it. Remember, we are just the go-between between them and our Heavenly Father. That's all we are. He is the healer. He is the restorer. I love the Apostle Andrew. He's only mentioned twice in the Bible. And the Andrew ministry that he, he displayed there, the first time he went to his brother Peter and he said, I have found the one we are looking for. The second time we hear 
of Andrew. He had been chatting to a little boy who had this little pack lunch of a couple of fishes and a couple of loaves of bread. And he brought him to Jesus. And this is what the Andrew ministry is. Taking people to Jesus because Jesus is the one that fixes that. If we try to get into fixing it, we're going to fail because we're incapable. So be, be aware that when people come in crisis, that you're not trying to fix it. You can get caught up in their struggle, but ultimately we've got to go back to the Lord. And that's our role, our connection between people that are struggling and the Heavenly Father that loves in this most incredible way. So we're looking here a little bit at listening skills. So as you look at that little picture, what are you seeing? Well, we can see various attitudes. We talk about body language and we always need to look at the body language. And these can be either the one that is got the problem. And just imagine if you got a problem and somebody is listening to you with their arms folded and crossed over. Or you might be trying to share something to them and they are close to you. So always listen to what they are saying and what they are not saying. In fact, what they are not saying is often very much more important than what they say. So we are listening into what we call the meta communication. Now in my work, I am constantly watching, watching facial expressions and twitches and things like that. Because our lower brain where all this problem is rooted and struggling, um, the facial expressions come from the lower brain. So you can quickly see on a person's face what they're struggling with. They might be saying, I'm fine, but you can see in their face, they are drained. It's important to listen to what they are not saying. Okay, now I've got something here. This is an attitude we all need to try and uh, keep. So we can be safe. And we can be unsafe. We can be certain. And we can be uncertain. So when we're working with people, we can be in these various uh, areas as we are working. And if we look at them, we could be unsafe and uncertain. And that is not the place that we need to be. We could also be unsafe and certain. And that is not really the place that we should be when we're working with people. Then you could be safe and certain. But remember what I am saying, you do not know what has gone in their life. They are the expert of their life. You have no idea what they have gone through. So we cannot have this position. What we have to be is safe, but uncertain. The curiosity, the uncertainty, safe uncertainty. You know who you are in Christ. You know you have the Holy Spirit. You might not know the answers, but you can wait on the answers. So we can always be safe when we're working with people. And because as we are safe, they will pick that up and then they'll talk. But we always need to remain uncertain about their struggles 
not jump to conclusions. Oh, this is your problem. That's your problem. Because we just do not know. I've worked with people. I'm going to tell you a little story here. No, I won't tell you the story now. I'll tell a story a little later. I'll continue with listening skills. Remember that every behavior forms a purpose. People do things for a reason. So what does this behavior talk about? Why is that little boy doing that? He is gain, gaining something about that. And as the little uh, caption says, he's annoying. Why is he annoying his sister? It can be a number of reasons. And I want to just share a little story here, a story of a boy running away. This is a true case study. This little chap was about, I think he was about eight, nine years old. And he kept running away from school. And obviously the school was very upset and they were complaining to the parents about this child that was naughty running away from school. And they had all the uh, authorities about this child that kept running away from school. Eventually, they decided to bring in a family therapist to try and help what was happening there. Mm -hmm. The family therapist sat down with the family and quickly worked out that mom and dad were continually threatening to leave. And this child did not want them to break up. And he knew that if he ran away, both parents would come together to find him. His whole behavior was about keeping his, his parents together. Every behavior forms a purpose. And we mustn't jump to conclusions just because a child is running away that he's being naughty. Because there might be a very, very important factor in his life that he's trying to achieve or she's trying to achieve. So always remember this. What is this behavior about? It's forming a purpose. So let me give you a very, very simple example. As somebody's got a drinking problem. Using alcohol. Well, we can say, oh, you mustn't get drunk, and that's what the scripture says. But what is the purpose of the alcohol? It's probably to numb pain. And what is the pain? And we've got to go down and find out where the pain is. Now, I'll tell you this little story. It's a rather sad one. And this was still back in South Africa. And we had in our congregation a guy that just didn't seem to be able to get his life together. And I was very young in the Lord. I'd, we'd finished Bible school and I was with the pastor. And they uh, were doing a deliverance on him. And after the deliverance session, you know, he was relatively calm. Everybody was saying, well done. You know, we've done well. We kicked the demons out, etc. And uh, everybody went home. And a couple of weeks later, the same behavioral patterns began to emerge. And very, very sadly, they were saying in the church, he wasn't walking in faith. And uh, I think he actually left the congregation. I had the opportunity of working with him. And I started to listen to his stories. And he recounted that at a very young age, his father and his mother were drunk. 
him and his sister were watching from the bedroom. And his father poured petrol over his mom and set her alight, and she died. I mean, it's a very tragic story. And we, in the body of Christ, should be very, very careful of jumping to conclusions and listen to what is going on. We only need to look after ourselves, and this is very, very important. You've got to look after yourself. Remember, we are the most important tool that Jesus can use. We are his ambassadors. We are the connection between him and the person that is struggling. And we need to keep ourselves safe. And I'm not going to go into these things. These can be... Uh, could be a talk on their own. But we need to keep good boundaries and we need to be keeping ourselves safe. So if you are working with people, and I know most of you won't work with people like that, that are um, um, psychopaths or uh, on that spectrum, you don't need them to know where you're living. You don't need them to be knocking at your door late at night. But there has to be certain other boundaries as well. Um, you must be careful because when you start opening your heart to people, people are looking desperately. Um, you need to keep a certain safe space uh, that you, you have time for yourself, for your family, spending time with the Lord and all that sort of thing. So there's good boundaries that you need to be uh, keeping and keeping yourself safe. Always seek help. Uh, we are not um, lone rangers. We're not uh, the lone ranger on this quest on our own. We need brothers and sisters around us um, I've got a team of intercessors that I am totally reliant upon to help me with the work I do. And I seek their advice and I seek people to speak into my life. So don't think we can do this on our own. We need others. If you're working with something that is beyond you, Please refer. Don't handle things where you haven't got sufficient understanding. And uh, I'll talk about this maybe at a little later, where we're working with people or that are probably on the autistic spectrum or what we call neural diverse. And the way they think is completely different to the way most of us think from an emotional. So if you're finding this is a something that is a little bit beyond your ex expertise, uh, expertise, you know, be, be open, be congruent and say, hold on, I, I don't have the answer to this. I think I need to get somebody who's more equipped to do this, to help you, yeah. Refer them on, you know, seeking help. As we here at Revive Living Waters Ministry, as we start in the next year going out and uh, implementing this project that the Lord has given us hope for mental health, I will always be there to support you. As you work with people, as we designate people, or as people come to you and you're listening to their stories and you're struggling a little bit, I will be there to help. In my profession, we have what we call supervision. I have got two supervisors that I meet with every month that I seek their expertise to speak into my life to help me with my caseload. Working as a team, this is very, very important because it's good to work as a team. So if you're working as a husband and wife team, 
that's good or you're working as a, a couple team that's very very good but when you work as a team just be aware that one should be leading and the other just hanging back as a listening ear if both members are coming up with ideas and questioning the person that you're helping then this can get quite confusing because we'll each see things differently due to our experience, due to our understanding. So one team member would say, okay, I'm going down this route. I want to explore this. The other picks up something else, which is also a problem, and then goes down this route. And this does not help the person we're working with. So if you're gonna work with, some, uh, 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 with somebody, which is highly recommended designate okay who's going to lead and then the leader will refer to the other person what have you discerned what has the holy spirit said and you know when we uh, i haven't been involved in sozos and silvos but generally that is what they have they have the leader and then they have the other people listening ears and then they they do a bit of referring but don't cross talk each other when you're working with somebody. That can be very difficult for the person you try to help. And here's the main thing. Um, you need the father to give you his heart for his people. In my own experience, before I came to know the Lord uh, 1986, I had been gro had grown up with Eastern philosophy, the idea of karma. I had absolutely no compassion for people and their struggles. That was your problem. Get on with it. As I came to know the Lord, um, I realized that my heart attitude was not the right attitude. And I asked the father one day, and I remember very, very clearly asking the father, Father, give me your heart for your people. And I was speaking to Margie yesterday, and we were talking about the work I do, and she says, I don't know how you do it. And I also say, I don't know what, how I do it. But the father has given me his heart for his people. That's where the passion comes. Ask the father to give you his heart for his people. So now we're going to do a little bit of a practical exercise. And you've got your pens and papers and we're going to go through this. So I want you just to respond and write down how you feel you are now trying to help this person or this person is coming to you for help. And the story goes like this. There's a young woman is looking for help. She has accepted Jesus at a young age. She has recently married and she feels totally unworthy. As you listen to this, what is going on inside of you? What is your thoughts? Just, just, just jot those ideas down. What you feel, what you think. What's your understanding? What would you maybe say? Just think about that. I'll just give you a minute. Meryl, could you please repeat mm -hmm. the scenario? People have been watching that movie of Tom Hanks after this. Probably, yes. Okay, because I've got the name and everything. I've okay. Forgotten it. Okay. If you want them to do that for him. Okay, okay. Yes, right. Okay. Thanks. Um, did somebody, uh, that was you that was speaking, that was here, another them. Yep, yes. Right, let's just go on. So if you've written your ideas and thoughts, you don't have to share these. They're just for you, for your own. Oops, sorry, I just need to go back there. I'm just trying to get this thing out of the way. As she talks, you find out she had a childhood sweetheart. Everybody believed they would one day marry. Suddenly, at age 18, she ended the relationship. Everyone was surprised. 
and they did not know why it ended. So now, as you're listening to this, just notice what your thoughts are, where you're thinking. What would you say to her? What would you not want to say to her? I'll just give you a couple of seconds. Okay, let's go on to the last. She then starts to cry. And through the sobbing, she tells you she felt pregnant at age 18, obviously, and had an abortion. Now, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What's going on? So what I'm trying to do is to get you to notice your internal responses. Because we need to know what we are bringing into the room. My supervisor says to me, I've got my hot buttons. There's certain things that trigger me. I've got to know what they are and I know what they are. So that I don't become judgmental or critical but I keep an open-minded curiosity. So now here's the questions. Try and answer the following question. Why would this lady seek you for help? Why particularly you? What are you carrying, what you bring in that this person would come to you and tell you the story. Or alternatively, why would she not seek you for help? So we're doing a self-evaluation of where we are here so that we can be Christ's ambassadors. Well then, because I know that modeling is very, very important, uh, it's good to have very good role models. It's not that I am perfect, but let's answer this question. Why would she seek me for help? So just try and formulate some answers around that. Because if the Lord is going to use us to create disciples, we got to be aware of where we are at so that we can be a channel for him and not let our own stuff get in the way. And sometimes our own stuff means that this type of work is not where we should be and that he would use us in other places. And if you're not called into this specifically, I wouldn't say not try it, but don't make it your passion. You know, some people are just passionate about worship. That's what the Lord has called them to. Do that which the Lord has called you to. Some people are passionate about prayer. What I'm sharing here is a very, very specific type of work. And uh, we want to be Jesus. And there's various levels in this type of work. I mean, the case that I gave you, this case study that we gave now, is quite a difficult one. But it is one that you will probably pick up if you start doing this work. And we're talking about believers here. We're talking about believers. I just want to share one little story here. That's another sad story. Sorry about the sad stories, but it's important that we, we take note 
that we are not judgmental. I'm working with a client. She is a woman in her late 50s. Her children are all adult now. She was in the church. She would got married. She had had three children. And the marriage was very, very difficult. And one day she was in a church service and she was weeping and sobbing and crying. And this woman came over to her after the service and she started sharing. And this woman, unfortunately, told her how she was missing the mark with sinning. Her words to me were, I swore at her and I walked out. And she's not been back to church since. Sad. She hasn't brought her children up in the church. Just because somebody did not actually listen and didn't ask the Holy Spirit, what does this person need? They don't need our condemnation. They don't need our judgment. They don't need our performance. They need somebody who is like Jesus, gentle and humble, who demonstrates love and grace. Questions and answers.